that put progressive groups out there on the under, under, underground kind of. But anyway, Peter Coyote is now, everybody knows who he is. It's, everybody knows his voice. But he, he had a TV, and he took in Robert P. when he was 15 years old and took him up. He had a new spot up north somewhere, and he had a TV on, on the property. So Robert P. saw the TV, and he asked him for the TV, and he said, yeah, you can have it. So that TV, the first TV out there was actually Peter Coyote's TV, and Robert P. put it up. And that's a story that nobody, nobody ever hears or knows about. But they came back now uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, Robert P. came back, and Peter Coyote came back. Uh, Peter Graff, a whole bunch of other people came back and brought another TV like 50 years ago, you know, they dressed the ground and stuff. The TV sitting up is pretty awesome. And all the kids that carried the poles out there were kids, you know, they were like from 15 to 18 to 24, 25 young adults. But they were that next generation. They carried the poles up. They did that whole thing back the way it was done in 1969. We didn't get that same spot back because the, the birds got his first dibs on it. <laughs> but we're close. We can see it. Yeah. And then it eventually, what, they, what we would like to do is maybe get enough public support for it, so that becomes part of a, a permanent monument or, or, or a museum out there. Because the Park Service has this thing that anything that was there when it was done has to stay kind of that, preserve it for history. Uh, I look around the island and I see these giant cannons and I see these big cannonballs and I see all that Civil War stuff. And we got a little bitty room that's about this big, you know, maybe, I know for seven people, maybe seven, you know. But that's our room, but yet the, all that stuff, the Civil War and all that, all that killing stuff is often really prevalent. And I'm thinking that we should have that same right to have our part of that museum, you know, as much as there's been, but, you know, that, that would take a little bit of probably. Julian and all this, all what we're aiming for is kind of bring down the road and aid and everything. So we have that permanent <coughs> We can have that place for our kids and go and say, hey, you know what? Uh, it's, it's happening slow. In, in uh, I think 2000 and something, anyway, in 1983 when I went back, they were mentioning things of all tribes, they were mentioning the Nato, rich and number of people. It was all about uh, treaty council and some other stuff that was going on. AIM and AIM was laying claim to everything. And it, you could, I couldn't say nothing. But I, I started to say it anyway, and I got a lot of really hard looks, but I don't care, I'm used to hard looks. <laughs> so I don't bother me, I'm like a duck out there on Alcatraz, I can shed all that stuff. <laughs> I've been there so long, maybe, I don't know. But anyway, they, they started doing a, a they did an envisioning program in 2016, and they were determining what they were going to do with the park between 2016 and, 2000, and 2016. Uh, so some of, one of the plans that you were talking about was how they were going to reach out to the public. So they had like a table, a, a big uh, kind of gathering with 10 tables, six people to a table, and all these sticky notes, you know? Everybody had sticky notes. And they started writing on the sticky notes. Every table had, uh, you know, some kind of subject. But they all wanted to talk about like the Civil War or the prison and stuff. And I, would, I didn't want to talk about that. That's not what I was there. I wanted to talk about Indian issues. So I asked the moderator, and I was carrying a cane anyway now, uh, you know, just kind of self-induced injuries. Uh, I did a, I got up and I said, you know, I need to get up, I can't stand, sit for a long time. Can I go to all these other tables? He said, sure. So I went to all the other tables, but I was by going to all the tables, I was able to influence each one of those tables. I said, Alcatraz, I didn't, they didn't want to talk, you know. I said, you need to talk about this. And then I got a couple of people, I think one of the guys, one of the guys from Philly got the ones that are ghost prison over there. So you got this big prison, it looks like a, a, a big, uh, Kind of like a wagon sort of kind of thing. I don't know what it is. It's such a great idea somewhere. And he said, yeah, that's a great idea. So anyway, after the whole envisioning thing, they determined that they were going to concentrate on two things. The prison because it was there, and the occupation because it's never happened anywhere else. So now they're, they're leaning more and more to, toward us, you know, and, and then we started doing, we started to do, do I asked about the, the paintings on the island. The, all, all, they had, uh, they've done so many movies, as soon as we were out of there, they whitewashed everything. They took out the signs that were, you know, that bothered them a little bit, they covered them up, and the rest they whitewashed. And over the years, they whitewashed everything. So you can see nothing about the Indian occupation. They didn't say nothing about it. They didn't even already mention it. You know, Craig came on, he started talking about it, and stuff like that. You know, anyway, so in, uh, I think 2011, something like that, 
they will paint it there as being decided that they're going to knock, either knock that water tower down or repaint it and refurbish it. So they decided because it was kind of so attractive and part of that thing that they would refurbish it. So you, they refurbished it, they sent it, they reinforced it, sent it, sent it, it down, put epoxy primer and all this good stuff on there. And, and of course, so that way it goes on because they went down to the metal. And they had put a, a, a some ones of the people that taken photos and they were going to try to put this stuff on a grid. I don't know what they meant by a grid. I couldn't figure out what they meant. Anyway, when you try to put this grid to put the letters back on the island, they found out that there's no way they were going to do it because different people painted it and they're not the same shape. So the grid's not going to work. But we got out there to paint it. But before we got out there to paint it, I got I remember on the day that it's normally off, sometimes off, off season, I suppose, and I seen something going on. I said, what's going on up there? And he says, oh, we're getting ready to paint the water tower. And I said, who's getting ready to paint the water tower? He says, oh, the Bohemian Water Company. And I said, oh, when you hit these, huh? And he said, no. And I said, well, they can't paint it. And he said, what? I said, they're not going to paint it. They can't paint it. He said, what do you mean they can't paint it? But that's not exact words I use. I use the BS words. <laughs> and I said, they're not doing it. And uh, they gave me 10 days to get people that were, you know, original painters. So we, we had a total of 17 people. A lot of people said they were coming, but 17 people actually came up. But I had, you know, about half of them weren't there. So we screwed it. The, the, the water tower was painted by Richard Oaks' grandson, uh, Richard Oaks' daughter, uh, a couple other people that were there, and myself, and maybe seven, a total of seven people that did that. But since then, We've been painting, putting all these other paintings back, and some of the paintings that, that, that were water, they're all coming back. But the interesting thing about the water tower itself, before we painted it, was because they didn't have any grid, they couldn't figure out how to put the letters back. But when we got up there to, to actually paint it, we were looking at it, and the sun was hitting just right, and because of that lead paint that we had used those years way back, we had an etched into the metal, and it came right back out. So it was like, wow. You know, and those letters are pretty much the same, so they can not change. And that's what, that was without any interference of high tech and all that other stuff. Yeah. So after that, now we've been we painting all of Now that before Credo verified this, they were called political statement. Uh, I mean, the graffiti it was all graffiti. Now it's all known as political statement because everything is a political statement. And over the years, we've all been able to talk to people out there and tell them, hey, we that's not. This is a, a, we're saying this is ours, that's a statement, that's not graffiti. So now all the docents and all the people have to refer to it like that. And that's because we're trying to educate them to that fact. And now they're, they're telling the hit, real history by my being out there and some other people from Native and bringing other people that, from Native. We're able to bring people out there that are actual Native people from different tribes to speak their own language and tell their people about their history there. Not out of the government's books, not out of the U.S. history books, because that's all. As you know, you know, uh, Trump thinks he's the inventor of fake news. That started in 1492. We've had fake news forever. So, you know, but that is one of the reasons that we're doing this. Like now on November 20th, we're all going to be there today, all of us. And most of them that will get the original painting, which is really going to be awesome. We're going to get back, get to paint that sign right back in the front. We get off the, off the boat and it says Indian Night. It says penitentiary now. When they put a, up a brand new sign because the other one was dry rotted and I told them they needed to make one that would last at least 50 years and another one was dry rotted would last maybe 10. So we got a new new sign and they painted it back like the old prison signs and I wanted to cross it out all over again. And then they came to that on the 20th. So that's going to be not <laughs>
painted the political statements back onto the island. There's a sunrise ceremony every year. It is this very important and powerful moment in our history that has stayed in this community and the Native community more broadly in a way that you know not everything does. So what was it that was so, in your, in your, from your perspective and your experience, special about Alcatraz that has made it sort of last? Well, this is my perspective that uh, it was more of a, a spiritual uh, reawakening of our, our culture and our languages. It was a reconnect with our people again because <clears throat> the government passed laws to make our languages, our ceremonies, our songs, our prayers, everything that we did, they made it illegal. And it was when we took Alcatraz, and we didn't actually realize that ourselves until later, but when we took Alcatraz, it initiated the spark of uh, re-identifying ourselves as Native people again, because we were being assimilated so rapidly through the other thing that the government did was to pass laws to take all the children and put them into Christian and government boarding schools. So they were separated, the generations before us, from their, um, from their cultural base. And then with, with uh, my generation at that time, they were gonna just put us in the cities and let us assimilate into the mainstream of American society. So taking Alcatraz was uh, reconnecting with our, our culture, our identification, and our spirituality, because that's how we were able to get through the genocide and everything else that happened to us. So it's really important to rekindle that, and that's why it was, um, I think that's why it was special, because it wasn't only us that uh, were impacted, but it just went nationwide, and then it went worldwide. I mean, I heard people from the Philippines saying, oh, the Indians are fighting back, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to keep standing up and resisting and fighting, and they did. So it just kind of initiated a spark that happened, you know, throughout uh, our population, our people, and throughout everybody else as well, and became international. And we didn't really realize that at the time. You know, we were just uh, wanting to take Indian land back, <laughs> you know, because it was disappearing so rapidly, and. We were not, uh, a lot of the people that came out had just become native the day before. I mean, nobody really knew what it was to be native. And they, but they wanted to re-identify. So that was the first step, was the re-identification of our people. And then once you identify as a native, then you want to know your tribe, and you want to know your your ceremonies and your songs and your languages. So it just initiated that whole, um, that whole spark that started it all. We had no idea it was going to be the way that it happened or that President Nixon was going to support us, and he did. He did his first uh, message on, uh, his, his White House address on Native American policy. So everybody hated him, but he did the, the White House policy on Native Americans, which was very supportive. And then he started doubling and tripling the Bureau of Indian Affairs budget and the Indian Health Service budget and uh, initiating policy that would be supportive of our people and tribes out on the reservation because it was so, it was, it was at such a crucial point prior to that, you know, where our people had been living in poverty, coupled with that cycle of dysfunction initiated through the government and Christian boarding schools where our children had been physically harmed and 
um, mentally, spiritually, and even sexually. And it started a whole cycle of dysfunction right there on the reservation, coupled with poverty and um, no education, um, no food. So it was really at a crucial point for our people on the reservation. Just the fact that we were able to get flour donated to the tribe so that people could make bread or something was was all that was going on on the reservation. On the reservation. So we were doing really well, you know, during the depression because um, that was shortly after the Indian Reorganization Act in 1934 where they put us under the federal system and the federal corporations. And, and they were bringing out cattle and trying to domesticate us and make us into farmers. And, um, but then we went through that depression and everybody got jealous that the Indians were, had all this land and had cattle and farms. And so uh, that's what initiated that uh, termination era was <clears throat> to take all these things away. So that's what we're coming out of was the Indian Land Claims Act where they were taking all the land back, legitimizing the largest land steals um, and the termination policy itself, Public Law 280, where they had taken the whole state of California, for one, and put it under state jurisdiction. There's Oregon, Washington, Minnesota. They completely terminated 106 tribes at that time. And the rest of the tribes were, you know, just at the mercy of the state, and the state uh, were not very nice to Native people. They just wanted the land. And, and there was no history of what was going on to our people. And most Americans thought that that land was their land. You know, that it, it was all, you know, they didn't have a history of how it was taken through the genocide and boarding schools and uh, the federal, um, well, the prisoner war, war camps called reservations. So, uh, and then, and then of course, in the relocation policy to push us out to the cities. So there was a lot of things that happened, and that's why I had to, you know, describe it, you know, through the laws that were actually implemented at that time, so that we could have an understanding of what happened to our people. You know, like. I, I would see uh, movies like, oh shoot, what was that? That one Indian guy did a movie. Uh, it was in Northern Idaho. He did, uh, it was, a, what was that movie called, Jess? Well, anyway, he wrote a book on it. And, uh, it was about Indians being alcoholics on the reservation. But there was nothing to tell how we got to that point, you know. And that's why I thought it was really important to describe what had happened and why our people were becoming alcoholics. And we had teen suicide out at Fort Hall in 1968, which was 10 times the national average, and it was just unheard of out in American society, and now it's, you know, something that that everybody is aware of today, but, <clears throat> you know, if you follow the history, then, which has never really been written about, and if it is, it's coming from the colonizer's point of view, then um, there's never been any really truth in history, and that was one of the reasons why we wanted to establish Native American studies in our own interdisciplinary departments of ethnic studies so that we could tell the truth in history, but of course they all whitewashed that and you know we still don't have the true histories and that's why one of the reasons why I wanted to write that book. Because there's a lot of history out there and what happened in California is just horrible with the California Indians and how they were slaughtered and the genocide that they faced, and then they had one Indian left, and then his name was Ishii, and they put him over at the University of California Museum, 
you know, it's, it's, it's crazy, but we're, you know, my dad says, you know, you see uh, an ant pile and somebody's going to go over there and kick it or try to burn it or get rid of all those ants. I don't know why, but they're going to do that. And then he says, and then you'll see all these little ants running away. He says, that's who we are. We, we came from that. It was all those little, you know, the ones that got away, and this is our generation. Now we're um, trying to continue to survive, you know, throughout that lifeline. There's only 1%, if there is 1% of Native American people left. So we don't have that big political block, and we really depend on um, on American society to be supportive and to understand and to know. And there's nothing written about it. We don't have any media attention, and that's why that's why it's so important for Alcatraz to continue to raise those issues and. Um, the canoe journey was awesome, uh, Julian. You know, he, all the tribes from uh, Washington State and through there all came to recognize Alcatraz, and they uh, they were the tribes that were fighting the fishing rights at that time. You know, before Alcatraz, there were a lot of tribes and people that were fighting, trying to bring recognition to the issues of broken treaties, and you know, they had people like Marlon Brando and Dick Gregory and a few of them recognizing them, but they never actually, uh, the United States never actually would honor those treaties where those tribes had their fishing rights. So right after Alcatraz, you know, we started, I started with the Native American Rights Fund. We actually litigated that fishing rights issue and the, the boat decision where Native people got half of that harvest. So we continued on with the litigation for the past 50 years through the Native American Rights Fund and other people, uh, you know, they did other things like, uh, they started organizations, they were propelled throughout the, uh, the government, the Indian people that were there. So more people were at more liberty to do things to help their people, but it was it was just really a good shot in the arm at the time. And although we didn't realize it, you know how how strong that would be. I didn't I didn't realize it, you know, at the time. We were just doing what we thought was right. 